Good morning. Um, thanks for coming. Um, first of all, a short introduction of myself. My name is um, Bernd Erk. I'm, I'm one of the Asinga co-founders from the project. Um, and my main responsibility now is doing community stuff and project organization. And you can reach me on Twitter if you want like to read that. Um, perhaps I'm not sure if you really want that. So before I start, thank you to the Hesky guys for, for setting this up, for inviting me and, and help me getting these, all these um, visa stuff organized and everything which is necessary to come over to India. I like it very much and it's definitely not my last time over here. Uh, independent if you invite me again or not, so, but I will come back again. Um, so the Asinga project, before I start, a quick poll. So who knows what Asinga is? Okay, I would say 50%. Who knows what Nagios is? Okay, so we try to change this <laughs> in, in the next 30 minutes. Okay, um, what Isinga is, Isinga is an open source monitoring tool. So, so our general approach is like we have a scalable system um, which is extensible. We, we check the availability, we do notification, um, and we provide data for reporting. That's our basic approach, what we have. So originally we, we took the Nagus code base in 2009. Um, I think at this time it was Nagus.2. Um, we took the code base into, into Isinga 1, which is the fork we, we are still running for years now. Um, but we started in 2013 to, to develop an independent core, which is redeveloped from scratch, so there is no line of code from the old Nagus style in it. And we have this Isinga 2 since 2014 now. Um, and this is a project driven mostly by an international team. So a lot of them are in Europe, a couple of them are in the US, uh, in Africa, New Zealand, um, perhaps somebody in India. So if you want to join, it's an open source project. You can do so. We have a lot of work to do. Um, what we have as a stack is that, perhaps you can see the pointer, we have the old Isinga classic. This is what, what, what Nagus was used to be. Like Nagus with, with the NDO utils, we put them together. And this is what we, we, we used for years but we had several limitations with the old core. Um, there are a couple of reasons um, related to the software itself, to the, to the style how it was developed, and also to the external um, things like that. We have, still have these classic CGIs, you know, this old Nagios thing, pretty shiny uh, thing, we still have it. Um, and we're working on a couple of new interfaces. We have, um, we have um, reporting, which is based on Jasper reports. It's an open source reporting suite. Um, but today I will focus on Isinga 2 and Isinga Web 2. So we are not um, discontinuing Isinga 1. So if you use this, um, but we will not provide any major features for it. So we, we focus on having security updates or if somebody sends in a patch, so we will do it. And we have releases after releases, but we're focusing on, on our new products um, to bring them on the road. So a short introduction what Isinga is. It, it monitors everything, so you nearly can monitor everything. It has an, if it's able to be connected to a network, you can monitor it, or it's in sensor, whatever. And we're gathering the status out, so if it's okay or not, if it's reachable or not, and we're collecting performance data. So every time we go to a server, so the standard interval is about five minutes, we go there, we get, is it okay, and how was the performance, for example, um, for an HTTP check, what was the response time? Um, what we do is notifying using nearly every channel. So default is email, which is the most easiest thing. Text message is popular. The, the most safest one alert is, is um, calling somebody. So doing a voice call, um, doing a text to speech, read the message and force him to say press two to, to acknowledge this message. Because also text messages sometimes can take a couple of time until they reach the destination. And, and voice mails is the hardest thing to set up normally, but it's the best thing to to alert somebody. So we consider dependencies. So if somebody, um, some servers have relation to each other or something like that and you configure that, we, we're able to handle it. And we, we handle events. So we have something like event handler. If you know Nagus, you know what an event handler is. Like, for example, if a web server goes down, we can restart it um, executing a script. Um, we, we check and forward logs. Um, means all these, all these information we gather, we try to to provide it to other tools out there. So we, we provide logs using, for example, a GALF output, writing to Logstash or Greylog. Um, we can write performance data to Graphite or InfluxDB or OpenTSDB, all these systems out there. And also we provide data for SLA reporting in the database. So for now, um, we're supporting um, MySQL and Postgres as a database backend. Um, and also what you can see the Nagios and all the Isinga was based on C. We are working with C++ and Boost, which 
gives us the ability that we work on every Linux, Unix, but also you can run Isinga on a Windows system if you want to. So it's not our primary platform, but it, it, it works really well. So perhaps you have some problems with the plugins on a Windows system, it could be. Um, but it, in general it works and you can use also Isinga as an agent on the system. For all that basic checks out there, so a lot of plugins for Isinga, we, we have a, a template library that's shipped with Isinga, so all these standard things, disk, load, everything is configured. You just have to use it, but you don't have to think about how we can configure the monitoring command or something like that. Um, so the current version is uh, 2.3.4. It's, it's out since April. We have a lot of modules out there for Puppet, Chef, Ansible, um, and we're working on SaltStack. So we discussed it yesterday evening, so we hopefully get this on the road, that we have um, SaltStack support as well. Um, if you want to play around, we have, we have Vagrant boxes where you can spin up the machine with all that graphite stuff. So it's easy to try out. So why is Nagios good? Um, and the history of Isinga is all the Isinga people which talked uh, Nagios uh, at this time. We were all huge Nagios fans. So we saw that Nagios has big advantages. Um, but the development process was pretty slow. So let's say it was not existing. There was no development. Um, and therefore, our, our basic concept in Argus we really liked. So it's very easy to monitor things with Argus. Just for me, it's a major reason why it's so popular because it's, you just can write an easy plugin. It's very easy. Um, it's a simple software stack. So we don't have to set up a lot of queues and stuff and, and a lot of dependencies. So it's very easy to get a first monitoring result. Um, we like that concept of active checks. So you can do something like a monitoring agent on a system with send passive data. You can do that. But I think the, the most power you can have is really actively going on a system every minute, every second. You can do that with Isinga too and check if the status is okay or not. And we have millions of plugins. Okay, perhaps not really millions, but a lot of. Um, so the question, okay, why Isinga then if Nagus is so good? One thing, Nagus does not scale. So if you have Nagus on a single box, you see that one CPU is burning down the house and the other one is, they do nothing because it's just a single simple loop. Um, and that's a, a big issue. So there are tools out there and add-ons where you can spread the load a little bit or you can split up the configuration to a couple of nodes. Um, but this is a big issue in the, in the basic concept of Nagus. And this also comes to the problem if you send passive data or send commands to Nagus and he's under heavy load, that he stops working. So this these load issue in Argus is really a big thing. Um, Isinga 2 is multi-threaded, so it's, it's using all the CPUs, hopefully. Um, load is distributed automatically, so if you have so many checks you want to execute, and, and then you can add more checkers to the system, and then they split up the configuration, and, and, a, and a couple of server checks the system. So you can monitor in a second interval, but caution here, the plugin has to be a good one. So if you start a 40 megabyte Perl monster every second, we will not have a good weekend. So benchmarking, um, so benchmarking is, is, is not like saying something, something all this bad, but just to give you, give you an idea about. So we see um, on line number one, I don't know if you can see it, is, is Isinga 1. Um, um, in the middle is Isinga 1 plus Gimen. Gimen is a framework where you can distribute these, these check load to other nodes. And in the back we have Isinga 2. And we did this benchmark on a single box um, with 1 million services in a 60-second 60 interval. So there was, it, was, it has been dummy checks, but for all of them. So the, the simulation was equal for everyone. Um, but we're really good in, in, in doing this because we are a fork machine. The basic concept is like forking plugins, and we can do that very good. Another disadvantage in, in Argus is adding modules is hard. So if you, for example, want to use and your utils, want to write to the database. It's like you have to download the files. Is it my mouse? No, it's yours. Um, you have to download and your utils. You have to configure, make, make install. Sometimes you have problems with the compiler, and then you have to install it. So there are packages available um, as well, but adding new models, because Nagus has this event broker concept, and it's really hard to add new models. And all these things um, we, we solved in, in having a modular architecture. So Isinga, the core, um, this is what we, what we ship. And then we have all the features around it. Means we have Isinga, if you want to do something, you always need the middle of it. But then you can decide on your own if you want to do checks on that machine or if you want to write to the database or if you want to provide a graphite. 
So if you set up a mesh up system, you can have um, you can distribute the features to a couple of servers and let's say check on server A and write to Graphite on server B. They share the knowledge in between a zone, but I come to that later. Um, everything is configurable using uh, a CLI, all the features stuff, um, and it's very easy to add new things. And so compared to that, I'm going back to that example. So this is like configuring NDUtils on Argos and also perhaps Isinga 1. It's like in Isinga 2, it's this thing. A single two feature enable IDO, and that's it. And then you have the database. So you don't have to take care of about executing SQL scripts, whatever. So it's just like enable the feature. Uh, internally, it works like if you have an Apache website where you say sites enabled, sites disabled. It just sets a soft link, and then you restart it. And, and it's, it's the same for, for Graphite or other tools as well. Um, a big issue with Nagos is, is clustering and distribution. So there is no contribution. Um, distribution or clustering concept in Argos. So you can do that on your own. Um, means you, you, can, you can split up your configuration. You can um, copy over status data using SSH or SCP, um, but there is no failover. So you can use things like Heartbeat to set this up, but there is no application stack in there. Um, in Isinga, we have something like zones. So we created a zone concept where you can put all the things in one zone, but you can also make something like multi-tenancy, where you have customer ABC in, in, in independent zones, but have a master zone where you can see everything. And how does it look like? So, for example, you have a single box. You can take all the features and copy them over to another box, which is just a high availability. So it, it's independent if it's a, a Docker virtual machine or bare metal server. You can just say, I install it twice, then you set up an interconnection, all the connection works using SSL and certificates, and then you have a high availability scenario. The other thing what you can do is, like I mentioned before, if you have two servers, you can split up the features. So we can say, um, for example, in this server, I have the database, then you can um, write the database using um, the I Isinga API. So we tested a couple of it. It's, it's faster to to use the is, uh, internal Isinga communication, writing to a database, then using remote MySQL calls. So if you want to write to the database, it's best that you install Isinga there, just enable IDU utils, and write all the data from the zone to this Isinga machine and write it locally to the database. It's pretty much faster than using remote MySQL. And another feature, you can have these multiple zones. So we can have zone A, zone B, they, have, they are totally independent, independent. So they have their, their own brain, they share the knowledge in between that zone. And you can also do something more advanced like having a zone which is high availability. You can have a zone um, which is distributed and a zone which is just a single box. And you call, can mesh up all them together, which is, if it comes to a setup like this, I would not say this is totally easy, but it's, it's, it's doable. Um, therefore, it's, it's, it's advanced. So another disadvantage is security. So security in, in Argus is, let's say, horrible. NSCA is, and we still need to use it in, in Isinga 1. So we also still support it because a lot of people use it, but please don't use it. NSCA is really crap um, because NSCA destroys your timestamp. So if you send old data to the server and you have a, a situation that your network is down for half an hour and then the data comes to the central server, then they um, replace the timestamp with the current time which means you can throw away all your SLA data. So please don't use NSCA. That doesn't make sense. It's better to, to copy the performance files over with SCP, which is um, the better way. NRPE has a couple of security issues all the time. Um, it's the way they, they deal with the security. Um, so you can make it secure. You can do something like um, setting up SCP or all these things you can do with, with standard Linux, Unix tools, but you have to do it on your own. Um, in Isinga, the, the cluster communication um, is going to happen using SSL. So we have um, a bidirectional communication. If you have a specific network zone, you can connect into that zone, or you can connect from the zone outside to your master. So it's totally independent from which side you want to initiate the connection. We have something like a bin lock retention. means if you have a server somewhere else and the connection is broken for, let's say, hours, days, weeks, then we relay all the data, all the monitoring data later on and, and, and write it to the database that you have it over there. So because you, you can disable all these features, um, 
And the, the memory footprint of the Isinga core is about 10 megabytes at the moment um, with 100 checks. So you can disable all the other features, for example, and just enable the checker um, and can bring Isinga to your client. So you can also use the Isinga server as an Isinga agent because it's so tiny. You can just enable the checker. You can now then um, configure your, your agent if you want to use this these kind of method. Just put Isinga there, enable the checker feature, and then you can configure every host with, with your config management or whatever you want to use. And then um, check them locally with the Isinga agent, and all there are setting up the communication with the master server. So you still can use SNMP, SSH, and all the things out there. So in the new version, we bundle um, for Windows, we bundle NS Client. I don't know if you, if you know it. It's, it's, um, NS Client is a Windows program which enables you to really go into the details of Windows, getting VMI, getting performance counters, so all the Windows information and getting this out. NS Client is very popular to, to do that. And we will bundle that in the next version as well. So it's just a simple wizard, click, click, and then it's, it should be normally done. Um, another big thing is the configuration limits. So with Isinga 2, we are not compatible with the old Isinga configuration and not compatible with the old Nagus configuration as well. But this is many reasons. Um, we, we discussed that a long time because we know that, that all the people were complaining about um, missing things in the old configuration, but on the other hand, we knew that people were complaining if to have to write it new. Um, so people complaining anyway, and so we decided, okay, let's, let's make it new. So people, we don't like it the first time, but, but we, we didn't want to make the, the old things again. So I'll give you a couple of ex examples what we have. So this is a, a typical service check, um, which you know from Nagus or Isinga 1. Um, you have a service, and then you have host, and every time you add a host, you have to add these hosts. Um, and for example, in Isinga, you can do that um, using assigned rules. So you can um, add text to host, and then let's say, for example, in this, um, in this example, apply service um, to every host um, which has an address and its operating system is a Linux. And therefore, if you add a new host using your config management tool, whatever, um, you just can add the host and then everything else, all the templates are configured automatically. So it's more a rule-based um, configuration. Another example is that you can create combinations of it. So you can say, assign it, but ignore it where, where the server attribute is that is in test mode, for example. I want to check it, but not in test mode. Another example is this host group thing. I know that there are host groups and service groups in, in, in Isinga. Some people don't use it, but I think it's an interesting feature to, to group specific servers and areas together. But doing that manually could be a little bit hard. And we can also do something like um, an object host group assign. So for example, we have an object host with the address, with the check command, and then we have this host group um, and with a name, and then we say, okay, every host which matches this MySQL in the host name, we add it to the host group. So wherever you add a host in your configuration, it's added to the system. So one more thing. So perhaps for the guys which are into, into Isinga, somebody has a clue what, what this could be. I only have 12 minutes. Somebody has an idea what it is? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a time period based threshold. So what is what we do? We're using conditionals to say, um, is that server in that specific time period, send us that um, a specific value of, for example, load one, load one minute interval is return 30, or otherwise it's return 60. So you can work with conditionals, you can work with loops, arrays, and all that things. So you would not these kind of example in every host service definition, but perhaps you use this in a template and reuse it again. So this is very powerful if you, want, if you come to that level, um, dealing with the configuration. So just to summarize, it's new. Um, perhaps it, it, it takes you a couple of days to come into it, but you really, really love it. If you, if you play around with it a little bit, um, it's, it's really, really cool. So leaving the, the things you don't see normally, leaving the core coming to the things you see. So what you see is what you get um, from the Nagus perspective is hopefully not. Um, because, okay, so you can do it, you don't have to, but it's really not good. But to be honest, we use it as well. We have a different style. We have fancy buttons. 
and we have a couple of features like multi-select and multi-commands, but it's the same. Um, it works if you have 20 services, it works pretty good. But if it comes to that point where you have uh, multiple users, authentication, dashboards, and all these things, the old interfaces is not ready for, for an enterprise approach. Let's this say this way. So we also had, and this is an Asinga thing, so I'm, I'm laughing about our own tools as well. Um, we, we tried to put a mobile thing, but as you can see on the iPhone, it's Steve Jobs was still alive at this time. Um, so it's very old. Um, a couple of issues with the CGI. So CGIs need to parse status data. So if you have a lot of services, you need to reparse the file again and again. It's doing its reload, and it could be really, really slow if you have a couple of servers in it. So executing commands remotely is very hard. You can set up using an SSH tunnel or something like that, but it's very inflexible, and normally you have to run the CGI on that server where you have the Isinga core running. Um, on the other hand, in our portfolio, we have the same issues. So we have, we have the old um, CGIs, we have Isinga web version one, um, which, is, which is not so bad, but it's hard to extend. We used a lot of XML, which at this time seemed to be a good idea, but now we know it's not a good idea because people never find the right place in the configuration to put things in. So perhaps if you're into it, you can handle it, but um, it, it was in, in a lot of parts in the backend, it was too complex. And we had no interf unified interface so far. And what we did now is that we have, we we're having a new inter web interface, it's Isinga Web 2. It's very easy to extend, so it's, uh, it's based on PHP. Um, we have a lot of um, authentication providers where you can connect to LDAP or internal DB or um, Active Directory, which is an LDAP as well. Um, we support um, database or live status as an, as an access um, API, and it's responsive. Um, and the, the technical foundation looks like that we have Isinga Web 2 is, is just the basic framework. And imagine all the other things like, like perhaps like a WordPress plugin. So the Isinga is just the foundation which takes care of all the backend calls, API, and stuff like that. And also monitoring, which we ship with, um, and the documentation. These are the only two modules which, which coming delivered with Isinga Web 2, but um, they are modules. So you can disable them, you can kick them out, it's just a directory. And for us, it was important to be, to be totally independent from other things that are coming in the future because we don't know for now. And, and what we have now is like we have an, uh, a module for business process, we have a module for graphite, for PNP, um, we have a module for Nagus. If you if you know that it's it's a visualization mapping tool for Nagus, and can do that. And then I hopefully have two three minutes to show you in a demo how this looks like. Uh, okay. So, um, this is how Asinga Web 2 looks. Um, so, this is the landing dashboard you have. Um, and our design concept for now is that every time you open a detail for something, for a service check, whatever, it always comes in the column to the right. So, every time you do something, um, it opens a column. So, for example, if you have this critical check on the demo host, you can see the plugin outputs, you can see the details but you can go to the host as well, or you can see a history, which happened on this, on this machine. So we tried that, that everything is maximum um, one click away. So it could take a little bit in my, in my system. Oh, that's, I set up a new demo system yesterday evening. That was not a good idea. But um, for example, um, you remember rescheduling a check in, in, in Argus or Isinga 1. So we have to be true, it's the same issue in Isinga 1 as well. If you want to reschedule a check, it's like reschedule and then say now, and then say, do you really want it now, enforce now? So you have to make 20 clicks to just executing a reschedule. Um, it's not rocket science, but it's just, it's a single click. So check now because I want to see it now. I don't want to answer three more stupid questions. So we, we try to focus that everything is really easy and it's, it's really easy to, to reach something. We have a global search, which searches um, normally using the database. So it's, it's very fast. If you have two thrill mail and service objects in there, we're using the index. Um, in my demo system, it's pretty small. Um, but you can, for example, um, search the documentation or you see the host group over there. They have a host group with Linux servers with a couple of services. I can open them. I can go to the detail. 
see what's going on, what the other services on this host are, and also can have a look on the host. Um, we have all these, these classic parts, like host groups and service groups. We have an advanced filter thing, um, where you can filter nearly every attribute, uh, independent if there, are, if there are custom attributes or standard attributes coming with a singer, so you can filter all these things out if you want to and can um, store them as a dashboard. You can create PDF or JSON or CSV in every view, so you can also use just a VGET to get the, the JSON monitoring data out. Um, and what we also have is something like, um, I go to the problems view, something like a service grid. Um, the service grid is an example that um, shows you the combination of hosts and services which probably have the same problem. It's, sometimes it's very helpful if you, if you not have a clue what's, what's going on or perhaps you, you assume that you have a problem with the storage. Um, it's an easy method to get an overview and, and see um, perhaps there's a relation between specific outages and other hosts of the system. Um, another thing we have, it looks, looks not very good in my demo system because it's too new, is we have something like an event grid. Um, so mention the, the, the GitHub landing page where you see the event grids, you see the activity of users. We have the same like here. So you can go on a specific day or month and see um, if there's happening a lot. So you more errors you have, then it's more darker. So you can open the detail as well and see all the things happening on a specific day, which is, um, it's sometimes helpful looking for, looking after things after a couple of times. So looking on an error situation or an outage two, three weeks later, perhaps you can see something like a pattern because some things happen every Monday, every Tuesday, um, and this is an easy, an easy feature to do so. Um, we have also something like a timelining. We are, we are trying to enhance this a little bit for now um, because at the moment um, I just focus on the basic types. Um, the timeline is that you can, based on specific timeline intervals, go through your monitoring history, gather all the data, and, and draw it into the bubbles. That you can see the relation between have there been a lot of notifications or a lot of comments or um, did the people work more on these days so you can have a little bit more than a data analysis um, on that things. You can create your own dashboards if you want to, um, which is pretty easy, just add a link. Then you can add a new panel or a new dashboard and you have it and define it as a landing page. So it um, should be really easy to get a feeling about that. So we try to bring the reporting now we have in, in Jasper reports to the web interface. In that current release, we just have, we just have the alert summary report. I hopefully it, it works on my system. Doesn't look so. Um, the alert summary is just um, a standard report, comes with Isinga Web 2, which gives you the top five recent alerts you have, what's, what's happening all the time. You see the history. Um, you can scroll through it and see a graph. We will extend it in the future. So I think at the moment, this is, um, we have beta 3. So the release candidate um, will come at the end of May. Um, and then I, hopefully we will be final in the middle of June. And then we have five or six additional reports in that. So um, you, can, you can absolutely use it for production, so it's ready, but there are some missing um, buttons in the background and the user setting stuff. But all the, the monitoring things are ready and fine, and we, we know that a lot of people are using it in production for months now, um, but there are some issues we have to fix now um, to say it's, it's final. Okay, just going back to my slides. I've, I'm over time. Okay, going um, to the community. So one, one third thing is we don't know nothing about our users, uh, user base. So because you, they use the packages, clone the Git, we don't know who is using Isinga. Um, so yesterday I, I learned that Snapdeal is using it, for example, which was pretty cool for us to hear. Um, we know a couple of companies we, we, we put on here, like Audi using it for the, the whole environment. They have about 30,000 servers using Isinga. If you, if you use it um, and if you're happy with it or perhaps you're unhappy with it, but let us know. So on the website we have something like a feedback form or a user form. Here we can write it down because this is most valuable for us because we have no clue who's using Isinga. And that is something we're really interested in. If you work with, with plugins, 
So perhaps you know um, Nargis Exchange, for example, or Monitoring Exchange. These are platforms to exchange plugins. Um, but we have this issue for now that, that Nargis Enterprises kicks out every Isinga plugin on their platform um, because I think we're not friends anymore. Um, and therefore, we created our own platform. So we have our own platform sharing the plugins. Um, you can upload it, and, and what we have, which is a big advantage, you can sync them with, with GitHub or Mercurial. So if you have a project on GitHub, it's just like putting an, an YAML file in there, write what it is, what category it is, what software it is, and then we resync your plugin every day so you don't have to take care because this is the worst thing using these, these platforms. You upload it once, and after a week, they are outdated. So you, you could just sync your GitHub project, and we, we update it again and again. So we have a couple of events. Um, locally, we have an Isinga camp in Kuala Lumpur coming in June. Um, and we have one in Portland. If somebody is going to PuppetConf this year, um, it's the day after PuppetConf um, over there in Portland. So perhaps you can visit us there. Um, a partner of us provides training as well. All in Data uh, provide training here in India. So they have, oh, sorry, they have the training online. So if you want to do a training or learn more about them, so please check out their website. Um, and to, to have a conclusion, so our vision is that we, we want to integrate all these things. And it's just, just an example of the things we integrated now. We really want to go a step forward. So having supporting things like SaltStack, working together with them. Um, and we don't want to reinvent the wheel again. So we don't want to develop a, a logging framework. We don't want to develop a graphing framework. We want to be open, we want to provide all these interfaces that we can work with them. So our major target for, for the new version, it's 2.4 coming in October. No, it's coming in November. It's that we will APify everything. So all the things we have now, they are open. You can select them from the database. But in uh, Isinga 2.4, we will have an API for everything. And you can, for example, create dynamically host object objects. You can create services. You can delete them on the fly without restarting the Isinga core. Um, and this is what we're working on now. But if you're using it now, um, you're, you don't have this situ situation like in Argos or Isinga 1. Um, that you are blind during that restart process. So if you have a huge environment and restart, then you are normally, it could take a couple of minutes until the system is back, and we don't have that issue. So we are not truncating the whole database, we're just updating it, and after the validation of the, of the configuration, we restart Isinga, um, and you don't, you, are, you don't have a blind spot on it. So definitely download Isinga too. Um, we prefer that you use the packages. I think we are, we are able in most of the distributions out there. We also have a package server as well for where we, we put our Jenkins stuff in. It's packages.isinga.org. So really, resync your configuration. So if, you, if you're using Nagios, whatever, Isinga, Isinga2, really rethink about changing the way you configure your, your hosts and, and, and stop like writing 100 hosts down a big file. So really try to create templates and apply them and, and assign them. It's really powerful what you can do. Um, we have a, a pretty good documentation under um, docs.isinga.org. So everything is listed down there, every method, everything. But it takes too long to explain everything. But, but you really should rethink about how you, you do that approach. Because monitoring should be, should be a part of a bigger life cycle. So if you have config management, monitoring should be a part of it. It's, it's no isolated thing. It's not like I create services here and then open a ticket to somebody else and he creates a host. So monitoring is very important, but it has to be part of the, of the big IT life cycle as well to, to be automatically generated. Um, install Isinga Web 2. It's pretty easy to install. It's just a PHP application. Put it in a folder. We have an installation wizard where you can set up your Active Directory. You can set up the database, all that things. So it's, it's, you're guided through. So it's, it's really easy to set up. And please give us feedback. So if you have getting any errors or if you um, have a big wish list, so please let us know, and we, we try to figure out what we can do in the next versions. So this is really important for us. Um, and though for now, I'm through my slide deck. So thank you for the first time. Perhaps we have a couple of time for questions. Thank you so far. Hello. Hey, uh, do you have any automatic ways of uh, taking a graphite graph and alerting on it? Um, it, I, I talking about if we can if we can monitor so a graphite. Have, or yeah, so I have a lot of graphite data, mm -hmm. and I want uh, based on certain thresholds being reached, uh, create uh, like integrate graphite directly. Like if I have ten graphs, 
just create thresholds on those 10 graphs and just... I mean, for example, that you are learning based on a graphite threshold? Or graphite data, because, like, it's just data, right? In that's, that's pretty easy. There's a plugin out there. You can, uh, you can query the, the graphite AP, which is pretty powerful, and then on that, based on that, you can, you can create a state, and you can execute um, a notification command, so it's out there. Um, I don't have the name um, here, but I know that this system is querying the Graphite plugin, uh, Graphite API, and that's pretty easy to do. Yeah, but, but I was wondering if, like, you allow to say, okay, this, uh, you take this uh, Graphite data point, and everything under it, I just import. Okay, I got it. No, that we don't have that at the moment. No. Would that be interesting? Um, so one thing for now is that we just provide the performance data and say we can write it to InfluxDB Graphite, so, but then it's, it's up to you what you do with it. So we have a module that you can display the, the related data in the web interface and can show the Graphite information on the designated host. And what we are thinking about in the future is having something like an automatic, automatic learning. So where we store um, the performance data somewhere and, and based on the history and say, okay, every Monday we have that peak or this, this load pattern is different um, compared to normal Mondays, and then executing things on that. So we don't have that at the moment, but we're thinking about a solution, solving that problem. Uh, what level of integration do you have with Ansible presently? Um, we have, um, there's an, an Ansible cookbook. You can um, download it, on, it's on um, gitisinga.org. Um, there's an Ansible cookbook, and it's um, supporting Isinga, Isinga 2. I've never tried it personally, but they say it works. But there's always something saying it works, but now it should really work. Hi, hello. I don't know where to look, oh, sorry. Yeah. So what is the support you provide for virtualization and cloud, for CloudStack or OpenStack or okay. hypervisors? Um, at the moment, nothing. Um, so we, we, can run, we can run on an OpenStack or whatever, but we don't have something at the moment where you, for example, can query AWS and get the hosts out and, and monitor them automatically. We don't have that because um, we want to do the API support first. So that's our main target that we, we, at the end of the year, have this API and then have an external module, for example, querying OpenStack or querying um, AWS for specific host objects or specific services and then automatically add them um, to the core. So, for now, what you can do, I know that there are, there are a couple of modules out there where you can just query AWS, for example, and then create config files. So you can do that now, um, but it's, it's not integrated, so it's just like, it's a script out there, so you just generate Isinga config, but we want to have that more into the detail that we, we can actively query uh, a cloud provider, Open Ebola, OpenStack, whatever, and then generate the host or services. That's definitely one of the, it's, it's on the list, definitely. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Hi. Uh, so I wanted to know that if you are uh, making a SSH connection to mm. all the hosts to get the data, how you are planning to scale up? Uh, because I feel like SSH connection will be having an overhead. Uh, okay. So um, for that cluster for the cluster method we have, we don't using SSH. So we're using SSL. So and one way to, to, to check a Linux or Unix server is do the check by SSH. So go on the server every five minutes, f for example, and query data. Um, for our cluster environment using this SSL connection, but we keep it open um, and we don't reconnect every time. So um, if, the, if the connection is broken, we, we do the reconnect, so we try to, but, sorry, um, but we, we try to keep the connection open so we don't reconnect to every agent out there. Okay. Uh, one more question here is, uh, you showed a very good point of, uh, like, you know, you have a time-based monitoring, mm -hmm. uh, but do you have, like, uh, so basically all the monitoring systems are basically threshold based. Mm -hmm. But do you have anything like, you know, trend based monitoring? Okay. Or you are planning for any trend based monitoring? No, but this is probably, we have the answer with Graphite. This is something, it's, it's our roadmap. So we don't have that at the moment. You can, you can do that a little bit like using Graphite, using old Windows algorithm. So you can do that, but we not, don't have any integrated solution. But this is definitely, I, I think we cannot make it this year. Um, but this is on our list for, for next year, like, like having these, these trending things, storing the data for a specific time, working with them, and, and, and find out what's wrong. So, uh, but we don't have it for now. Okay. Uh, and you maintain your own database for the metrics? Or you are using the Whisper database, which is being the primary database for Graphite? Yeah. So, uh, for example, we have, we're using MySQL or Postgres storing the data, but we don't store 
performance data for a long time, we just store events. Um, and if you write it, for example, to InfluxDB or Graphite, then we just write it to, to that IP address and port, and, and that's it. So it's up to the Graphite guys what they do with it. Okay, so so we're not, not taking care about what Graphite does. You're not using any message queue technology no. for passing data to Graphite? No, because the, the easiest way, so in our opinion, was just directly write into Graphite. This is pretty easy, it works. And, and one of our focus was to, to keep it reduced. No, not setting up a lot of components, and we didn't have any bad experience like writing directly to Graphite so far. Perhaps somebody else have, had a problem with that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to write to Graphite. It's going right to other things. Okay. Yeah. So we have a bunch of techniques with Problem Live. We did look at Kikikatu, and it's pretty nice. We'd love to use it, but it's just. At this point, we have uh, a few thousands of like around 60, 70,000 Nagios checks at least, or probably more. Okay. Uh, so uh, what's the best part to migrate to Ikinga 2? And we're using Ikinga already, so. Okay. Um, so there is something like a conversion script, but I would prefer not to use it <laughs> because there is no intelligence in it. It's just, it just makes sure that, sorry, but your old crap is the same crap for the new version. <laughs> That's what it does. So it transfers things because, for example, um, in, in Nagus we had um, we had contacts, and I think we have users. And the conversion script does only does these things that it works again, but it doesn't take care about thinking about what is your structure, so how templates work. This is something you have to do on your own, probably. So if you have a config management and, and you have that intelligence there, you definitely should try to to start the way of monitoring over there. So it's just that monitoring is a part of that process. Um, but on the other side, you have to take care on your own how your infrastructure is built on, how template inherits um, make sense. So you can inherit multiple templates. You can also override them. So you can in inherit everything and then on a specific point just say, okay, at this server, I don't want this attribute. So we can also delete attributes. It's very programmatically. But yeah, we have no intelligence wizard which creates your good config. This would be a one million product, I think. Um, but, but I really, um, so far we see people say, okay, I had a look on it, and, and they were yelling like, oh, I have to do everything um, from scratch. But after a couple of days, they say, okay, it's, it's perfect. I never want to go back because I don't configure every server. I just use these apply assign rules, means you're reducing the configuration from 10,000 lines to 200 lines, which makes really sense to do so. Sorry? REST API? Um, it's coming in November. This is the API. We want to provide JSON RPC, REST RPC. We are not 100% sure. Um, what you can do is, um, for now, you can get, um, you can query the web interface, get all the JSON data, JSON data out, um, but the API will come in November to get that. Hey, uh, first, first row, first row. Pardon, I didn't get the. Is it on the microphone? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I heard you saying um, you have some uh, roadmap to create AWS API calls and then get uh, your configuration updated, right? Yeah. Which is what we are doing right now. We are using Isinga and it works great, though uh, I don't really like the way uh, it uses the CPU and memory, but it works really perfect. But okay. uh, the, the thing what I was looking for is, uh, uh, an event-driven uh, model to have uh, the configuration updated. Rather, you check it like every five minutes or ten minutes, and then see what is the change that you have in your infrastructure, and then update your configuration. Um, uh, so for example, you that, you, that you watch a specific stream and say if some something's coming up, then I create a host object. Something for example, up, it it uh, uh, it it pushes uh, uh, the data, and then something is listening to it, and then I mean the your Isinga. Uh, server is listening to it and then uh, making sure that the that instance is getting updated in your okay. um, Do you have something in, in, in your roadmap? Um, I don't think so for now. So our first target is that that we say okay we provide an API and but but after that API thing the process looks different everywhere because you watch a stream, other guys using a config management, somebody else is using Cisco Works and dump Cisco Works to get the switches in the monitoring. So the the, the sources could be so big that we in our first step say, okay, let's provide the API that, for example, you write a Python daemon or Ruby, 
watch for that event and then just executing the API to create a host, that, that would be probably the first way to do it. And then we'll see later on what is popular. So what can people, what would people see for a general approach to provide that? What, one thing that we are thinking about is that you can subscribe to, to events um, also with the API that you can say you can um, subscribe, to, subscribe to a specific pattern. Um, if something happens on a specific host that you get an alert, but we don't have these automatically generated thing. So first step is API and then you can do what you want. One problem that you might need to look at is uh, a false positive that you get you with this met method, which I have a lot. Yeah, yeah. could be. Uh, we're done with the question answers. Uh, please take them outside to burn. Yes. And thank you, burn. And uh, we have a container infrastructure. Thank you.